Hey folks, in today's video we're covering the latest game update for Crusader Kings 3, a bit of a surprise today to be honest. We've got PC update 1.13.2, I think many of us thought this might get rolled into the DLC update, but we have got it today, and there's a lot of changes here, some balancing for adventurers, some admin changes, a lot of roam fixes as well, which people will be happy about, but let's get into it, I'm going to cover most of them here, I will as always leave a link to this in the description down below if you want to go and read all the changes, but we're going to start with expansion features. So the admin government now has access to a new tab in the realm interface, listing additional laws that could be changed independently of the imperial bureaucracy to allow an admin top liege to have greater agency and control over their realm. The first one of these has been many requested, and that is added a new law for admin to prevent governors from using the boundary dispute and subsume governorship schemes, ensuring that your internal borders stay somewhat constant over time. And they've also added a new law for admin, which allows the top liege to prevent governors from declaring external wars. I know that is one a lot of people had asked for, so it's cool they've added that as an option. There are some fixes as well for admin governments, which we're going to cover later. And the next section is free features. They've added a new game rule to limit the amount of adventurers. So I guess this just puts like a hard cap on the amount of adventurers. I guess to help with PC performance, I wonder if you're having a slow running game, you could in your next game add this limit and maybe it would help you. The other option they've added in the game rules as well is coupled to some of the changes we're going to see in a second. And that is that they've added a new game rule to adjust the amount of damage gained by point of advantage in battles. The options now include 1, 2, 5, 7, and 10. I believe before Roads to Power it was 2, and then with Roads to Power they increased it to 10. And we'll see in a second in game balance. Do you know what? Let's just take a look at it now. So under game balance, default damage adjustment has now been changed to 5% per advantage in battles down from 10. So like I say, if I remember correctly, I think it was 2 before Roads to Power. It was increased to 10. 10 was way too high. It really was just too much of a positive modifier. I get the point that if you have these advantages, it's, you know, good to make them more impactful. I think it kind of got to the point where you were more worried about the advantages you would have rather than the actual troops that you had. Outside of, you know, levies and men-at-arms being, you know, totally different. Men-at-arms always being levies. And then you've got the men-at-arms countering and all that kind of stuff. But I think for the most part, most of us were more worried about the advantages. If you could stack enough of these, it didn't really matter what troops you had you pretty much could always win battles this has been nerfed back down to five percent and it is good as always they've added that game rule we were just talking about so you can alter this if you want to but i think five percent is probably going to be about right i think this will definitely make battles a lot more interesting so we'll see how that plays out in the actual game the other one i've picked out here which is a nerf to landless adventures is increase the cost of refilling men at arms with provisions by 68.75 percent very specific. I don't know why it isn't just 70%. I wonder if it's a rounding thing for whatever reason it is that much. This is actually a good change. I think like most people, I thought provisions would be a lot harder to kind of balance around moving around the map and things like that. But from my landless adventuring, like as soon as you built up a decent amount of provisions, you could pretty much just forget about them. You always got enough from events. Unless you were traveling massively across the map, it wasn't ever really anything I worried about. So this is actually a good way to, I think, balance it a little bit prevent you just stacking men at arms to crazy levels because it is going to make it much harder to refill them if you are losing those battles and things like that so this is a good change hopefully it works out pretty well in game but i'm actually down for this balancing around provisions i think it's a good way without nerfing like the fun level of adventurers just making it harder to have these massive army stacks to be honest the next one i've picked out is enabled raiding for governors of the frontier theme allowing them to raid neighboring realms because admin government types needed to be even better than they currently are. I just picked this one out because it's kind of interesting that the border ones can now raid people. I guess playing as one of these governors will be a bit more interesting now because you can just go raiding around, pick up some prestige and gold and bring it back and all that kind of stuff. So you might be able to build up your governorship quite good as one of these border ones now. The next one I've picked out is significantly reduce the likelihood and the frequency of the AI asking for a council position not accounting for when they have like a hook to make you do it. I believe this is probably like performance thing. I think in the background, it was probably happening in AI realms like all the time. To be honest, I didn't notice this super often in my latest campaigns, but I guess it's more of a performance improvement, I would think, just to prevent it being really spammed out constantly. Reduce the amount of gold you receive from dividends from a holding as a landless adventurer. I don't know if any of you have done this yet, but you can basically build a city as a landless adventurer and then you like rent it out to somebody. I will say the dividends from this are crazy or were crazy, I should say. Like they were pretty expensive to build, 
But then every year, you would pretty much get like 150 gold from it every year until, for some reason, they just stop paying it to you. I've never really been sure as to why they ever stopped paying it to you, but anyway, it's happened to me a couple of times now. I probably missed something somewhere in the game as to why that happens, but this is actually a pretty good change because these just printed money. If you had a lot of gold, you just build a bunch of these holdings, and then you pretty much just have infinite gold. The next one is asking a vassal to end their war now takes the loyal and disloyal traits into account, increasing and decreasing their acceptance respect. This is fantastic. I'm always happy about changes that make the traits more important to the game and really change character behavior based on those traits. And this one just seems like something that should have always been there. Like having loyal and disloyal affect these things. It probably should affect a bunch of things because if somebody's loyal to you, they're probably going to do what you say. And if they're disloyal, they're probably going to do whatever they want. So really good change here. I'm really happy that this has come in. Pretty interesting to see how actually it changes how we play. But it is something you're going to have to take in mind. And maybe you'll even try and get these traits activated on somebody a little bit more than maybe you do at the moment. The next one, made it more expensive for admin realms to convert tribal holdings, increasing the cost by 25%. Admin should not want to conquer tribal land, but rather have somebody else do it first, making it more civilized and then bringing it into their realm. I wonder if this is another thing to try force the Byzantines kind of into Europe a little bit more if you're expanding rather than you just thinking like, I'm going to take all this easy tribal land to the north and the northeast, really, where they always historically, in Crusader Kings, kind of spread really easily because those wars are generally pretty easy for the AI to win. I wonder if this is, again, trying to push it to kind of go west, head back into Europe rather than head out into Asia or something like that. Because outside of that, I'm not really sure why it's been changed. I get the, like, in-game reasoning, like, why would they want to take over all these tribal places? But um, outside of, like, trying to push them into Europe or something I'm not really sure well I guess you know into the Mediterranean anywhere really not just Europe obviously heading south and things like that as well and then next we've got a whole bunch of changes here for landless characters so moved one men at arms limit from roaring campfire to the swords for hire and legitimate camp purposes to promote specialization there's a bunch of these basically here where they've moved bonuses from buildings into the actual camp purposes themselves which i think is a good change there's also one here for the night limit being reduced overall but then the reduction being added into swords for hire and legitimus and a little bit into freebooters so really kind of nerfing the buildings but making the camp purposes a little bit more focused on certain areas so you can't really play as a scholar camp purpose and still have these massive armies they've made it so focusing on the camp purposes that are military actually give you these bonuses give you these knights these extra units and things like that so it feels a little bit different playing the different camp purposes outside of like the contracts it gives you the other bonuses the special buildings that you get the actual army part of it really wasn't that different between the different ones whereas i think with all these changes it is going to help with that they've moved things out of buildings out of just general adventure bonuses and put them into the specializations which i think is cool they do say here that's the whole point promote specialization make you actually think about which one of those you want to do more than i think most people probably left it on like swords for hire or something the other ones are cool but if you're just like generally playing i think most people probably just left it on swords for hire and just kind of had fun times with their armies and this is obviously playing into that a little bit more because that's where you get those bonuses but then if you go to the other ones you're going to have a smaller army, less knights. So it doesn't make you as powerful just all the time as a landless adventurer. I think these are pretty good changes to kind of make you focus a little bit more on one of those um, specializations rather than just really picking any of them and then going on your adventures and kind of just seeing what happens. The next bunch of changes are all around making requests once you have your patrons. I think a good place where they can balance adventures without making it annoying to play so the base acceptance of make a request interaction has been reduced to zero down from plus 30. So it's going to make it harder to make a request. AI is now less willing to give adventurers gold using the request just because the adventurer is poor, which was always a bit weird because you could just spend all your money on something and then make a request and they were more likely to give you money, which was a bit weird. The AI now gives less gold to an adventurer when just using the make a request interaction. So overall, they're just giving you less money from just asking for money. The AI will no longer give adventurers using the make request interaction more gold if they have plus 25 opinion of them, 
it now only counts being friends and lovers. Again, a good change here. A lot of these changes here were things we were talking about in the live streams recently. When somebody was asking me like how I thought they could balance adventurers, I always thought the interactions with patrons that you had was going to be the way to balance it because it was just too easy to get men at arms, too easy to get gold, too easy to get provisions from them. You only really had to do one contract for them and you could get crazy amounts of rewards for it really, to be honest, even from like counts and things like that. I always thought rebalancing that was going to be the way to rebalance the system without making it unfun. Even just being able to make the request is going to be harder to get gold and then you get less money anyway. Really just to make like the curve of improvement as a landless adventurer that little bit slower. I will agree with people, it is way too easy to quickly grow as a landless character. I think it should be at least over like one lifetime or two or three before you really start snowballing. I don't mind to be honest that you can snowball as a landless adventurer, it's fun. I play the game to have fun, but I do think you can do it under one lifetime and that is kind of crazy. So all these changes I'm down for, we'll see how they play out in the game, but I think these are going to make some positive improvements to actually making it a little bit more challenging. So you can't always just get gold and then just spend that on stuff and then you're just having a good time. So overall, these are great. There are some more changes to make a request here. I won't read through them all, but again, it is making it harder to get men at arms from them. It affects how many they give you, things like that. So that is awesome. I think that is going to slow down how many men at arms you can get. And then as we've seen, unless you're focusing on freebooters, swords for hire, it's going to be a smaller army you have anyway. So you're not going to be able to snowball even as one of these non-military focused ones as well. So all great changes, I think, here, to be honest. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. But I think this is a good way for them to go to nerfing the kind of landless adventure gameplay without making it just annoying to play. The next thing kind of linked to this is gather provisions. Now is a chance for critical failure and critical success. Critical success gives you more provisions. Failure can result in wounds, illness, or frostbite, depending on terrain. So given a little bit more risk here, you can't just mash the gather provisions and always get some provisions out of it. For the most part, now you actually have risk of something bad happening, which again is a positive change here, I think. Reduce the maximum men-at-arms regiment limit and size that you could get from an adventurer camp by four and five respectively, just reducing these men at arms sizes. So you've not just got these huge armies that then you can just be as powerful as anyone else in the map, which just doesn't make sense. The last one I've picked out here is increase the difficulty for adventurers attempting to chain church robberies. So pretty much just nerfing how you could just kind of chain these together and just rob stuff from churches. I mean, that did happen. So we'll see how much of a nerf it is. I'm guessing it just gets harder and harder and then you can't get a benefit out of it really. But we'll see once we get some of those chaining in the game itself. The next part is the bug fixes. Again, there's a lot of bug fixes here, so I've just picked out some of them that kind of caught my eye. I'm sure there's some other important ones, but these are just the ones I thought were interesting. When restoring Rome and converting to Hellenic, you now correctly destroy all Head of Faith titles you hold. There's some more changes to Rome as well coming later. They've now also locked DLC-only Dynasty Legacies for AI only, so I guess before, if you didn't own the DLC, the AI could use those legacies, even though you couldn't use them. I think that's a good change. Again, it's kind of crazy it worked that way. I kind of see why it worked that way, but I think it is a level playing field then. If you don't have the DLC, why does the AI have the DLC? That just doesn't make sense, does it? The next two are about Rome again. When restoring the Roman Empire with the Varengian Guard founded, you get to keep them, basically, and the special core position. Restoring the Roman Empire will now transfer your title men at arms to your new title, making sure they don't get lost when you convert over. Two fantastic changes. These are things that should have just been in the game when Roads to Power released, but it's good to see them added now. The next one is just kind of funny. Block the decision to form Portugal if Portugal already exists. So I guess you could get what, like double Portugal in the game? That would have been pretty funny. Made it easier for landed rulers to become legitimate landless adventurers by ensuring you get claims on all your former titles on transition. This is a good change because I think the legitimist landless adventurer system is actually pretty good. It's good, especially if you become landless and you want to get back landed. That was the whole point of it, really. But it was quite kind of like restricted or as it says here, probably a bug fix that it didn't always work how you thought it was going to. So this is going to allow you to get those claims and then get back into your old empire however you are able to once you lose those titles. The next one, I kind of thought this was already fixed, but I guess it wasn't fixed properly. Make sure the refill men at arms with gold option for adventurers states the correct numbers in the tooltip, which, you know, yes, 
it probably should tell you exactly what it's going to cost you. I believe this was fixed in the last patch, but I guess it wasn't fixed properly, so we'll find out. Although maybe that was about provisions last patch. It may have been actually. But anyway, this has been fixed, which is great to see. And then outside of that, that is all the bug fixes. Like I say, a huge list. I'd be here for like two hours reading through them all, so I will leave the link in the description so you can read all the rest to your heart's content. Next, we've got some art. I did the correct grudge icon to the game concept. So basically, if you were looking at like the wiki in game, it would show you the correct icon. I did the struggle trait background for modders. I guess that helps you out modders. I've no idea. Next is history. The Saxon culture now starts in the high medieval era when starting the game in 1178, and they've corrected the dynasty house for Robert de Rue. Definitely how you pronounce his name. So I guess that was wrong in game. Next, we've got game content. I did a new event for adventurers where a follower wants to get married to a local. So I guess they've pulled that in from the tours and tournaments DLC. They've added a new interaction, aid tribal development, which allows lieges to support their non-tribal vassals in converting their tribal holdings into castles. That's actually really good. That should help you get those conversions happening that little bit faster. Enable the decision to restore the Roman Empire for administrative. You can now adopt the admin government first and still restore Rome instead of having to do it in a certain order. The Byzantine cultural traditions, Roman ceremonies and palace politics can now be adopted if you restore the Roman Empire and don't have those traditions already. So that is cool. I kind of feel like Roman ceremonies should just be given to you when you reform the Roman Empire, but I guess that isn't how it works at the moment. I've not done it yet personally, to be honest, but I guess that isn't how it works, which is a little bit weird. And the next, we've just got the interface changes. Just a couple of little bits here, nothing too crazy, but you can see here, like added potential gold gain from mercenary contracts, interactions in the war overview for all participating landless adventurers. Just giving you that little bit more information in the UI. And then everything else there is kind of a bug fix for the most part. But anyway, that is the patch notes for today. Again, a bit of a surprise. We got another patch today. I kind of thought it would be in two weeks at this point, but some fantastic changes here. The landless gameplay. Let me know how that is playing in game. I'm going to be giving it a go today and seeing how these changes actually affect you playing it. But as always, hit that like button if you've enjoyed the video today. Subscribe if you're new here. I cover Crusader Kings every week on the channel. We do dev diary coverage, patch notes discussion videos, rankings, live streams, all that kind of stuff. And I also cover EU5 on the channel as well. But we'll leave it there for today and I'll see you in the next one.